which reveals the cherub toiling for the welfare of humanity and concludes in an entirely novel manner with the miracle of the flute. He first night of his incarnation arcade slept at the Angelisters, in a garret in that narrow, gloomy room Azarine which wallows along beneath the shadow of the old Institute of France. Ister, who had been expecting him, had pushed against the wall the shattered retorts, cracked pots, broken bottles, and odds and ends of iron stoves, which made up the furniture of his room, and spread his clothes on the floor to lie on, leaving his guest his folding bed with its straw mattress. The celestial spirits differ from one another in appearance according to the hierarchy and the choir to which they belong, and according to their own particular nature. They are all beautiful, but in different fashion, and they do not all offer to the eye the soft contours and dimpling smiles of childhood with its rosy lights and pearly tints. Nor do they all adorn themselves with eternal youth, that indefinable beauty that Greek art in its decline has imparted to its most lovingly handled marbles, and whereof Christian painters have so often timidly essayed to give us veiled and softened imitations. In some of them the chin blows with tufts of hair, and the limbs are furnished with such vigorous muscles that it seems as if serpents were writhing beneath the skin. Some have no wings, others possess two, four, or six, others again are formed entirely of conjoined pinions. Many, and these not the least illustrious, take the form of superb monsters, such as the centaurs of fable. Nay, one may even see some who are living chariots and wheels of fire. A member of the highest celestial hierarchy, Ister belonged to the choir of cherubim or carabs who see above them the seraphim alone. In common with all the angelic spirits of his rank, he had formerly borne in heaven the bodily shape of a winged bull surmounted by the head of a horned and bearded man, and carrying between his loins the attributes of generous fecundity. He was vaster and more vigorous than any animal on earth and when he stood erect with outspread wings he covered with his shadow sixty archangels. Such was Ister in his native home. There he radiated strength and sweetness. His heart was full of courage and his soul benevolent. Moreover, in those days he loved his Lord. He believed him to be good and yielded him faithful service. But even while guarding the portals of his master, he used to ponder unceasingly on the punishment of the rebellious angels and the curse of Eve. His mind worked slowly but profoundly. When, after a long course of centuries, he persuaded himself that Ialdabaoth in creating the world had created evil and death, he ceased to adore and to serve him. His love changed to hatred, his veneration to contempt. He shouted his execrations in his face and fled to earth. Embodied in human form and reduced to the stature of the sons of Adam, he still retained some characteristics of his former nature. His big protruding eyes, his beak nose, his thick lips framed in a black beard which descended in curls onto his chest recalled those cherubs of the tabernacle of Iave, of which the bulls of Nineveh afford us a pretty accurate representation. He bore the name of Ister on earth as well as in heaven, and although exempt from vanity and free from all social prejudice, he was immensely desirous of showing himself sincere and truthful in all things. He therefore proclaimed the illustrious rank in which his birth had placed him in the celestial hierarchy and translated into French his title of cherub by the equivalent one of prince, calling himself Prince Ister. Seeking shelter among mankind he had developed an ardent love for them. While awaiting the coming of the hour when he should deliver heaven from bondage, he dreamed of the salvation of regenerate humanity and was eager to consummate the destruction of this wicked world, in order to raise upon its ashes, to the sound of the lyre, a city radiant with happiness and love. A chemist in the pay of a dealer in nitrates, he lived very frugally. He wrote for newspapers with advanced views on liberty, spoke at public meetings, and had got himself sentenced several times to several months' imprisonment for anti-militarism. Ister greeted his brother Arcade cordially, approved of his rupture with the party of crime, and informed him of the descent of fifty of the children of light who, at the present moment, formed a colony near Val de Grace, imbued with a really excellent spirit. It is simply raining angels in Paris, he said, laughing. Every day some dignitary of the sacred palace falls on one's head and soon the sultan of the cherubs will have no one to make into desires or guards but the little unbreached vagabonds of his pigeon coops. Soothed by the good news, Arcade fell asleep, 
full of happiness and hope. He awoke in the early dawn and saw Prince Sister bending over his furnaces, his retorts, and his test tubes. Prince Sister was working for the good of humanity. Every morning when Arcade woke he saw Prince Sister fulfilling his work of tenderness and love. Sometimes the carob, huddled up with his head in his hands, would softly murmur a few chemical formulae, at others, drawing himself up to his full height, like a dark naked column, with his head, his arms, nay, his entire bust clean out of the skylight window, he would deposit his melting pot on the roof, fearing the perquisition with which he was constantly menaced. Moved by an immense pity for the miseries of the world wherein he dwelt in exile, conscious perhaps of the rumors to which his name gave rise, inebriated with his own virtue, he played the part of apostle to the human race, and neglecting the task he had undertaken in coming to earth, he forgot all about the emancipation of the angels. Arcade, who, on the contrary, dreamed of nothing else but of conquering heaven and returning thither in triumph, reproached the cherub with forgetting his native land. Prince Sister, with a great frank, uncouth laugh, acknowledged that he had no preference for angels over men. If I am doing my best, he replied to his celestial brother, if I am doing my best to stir up France and Europe, it is because the day is dawning which will behold the triumph of the social revolution. It is a pleasure to cast one's seed on ground so well prepared. The French having passed from feudalism to monarchy, and from monarchy to a financial oligarchy, will easily pass from a financial oligarchy to anarchy. How erroneous it is, retorted Arcade, to believe in great and sudden changes in the social order in Europe. The old order is still young in strength and power. The means of defense at her disposal are formidable. On the other hand, the proletariat's plan of defensive organization is of the vaguest description and brings merely weakness and confusion to the struggle. In our celestial country all goes quite otherwise. Beneath an apparently unchangeable exterior all is rotten within. A mere push would suffice to overturn an edifice which has not been touched for millions of centuries. Outworn administration, outworn army, outworn finance, the whole thing is more worm-eaten than either the Russian or Persian autocracy. And the kindly arcade adjured the cherub to fly first to the aid of his brethren who, though dwelling amid the soft clouds with the sound of citterns and their cups of paradisal wine around them, were in more wretched plight than mankind bowed over the grudging earth. For the latter have a conception of justice, while the angels rejoice in iniquity. He exhorted him to deliver the Prince of Light and his stricken companions and to re-establish them in their ancient honors. Prince Sister allowed himself to be convinced. He promised to put the sweet persuasiveness of his words and the excellent formulae of his explosives at the service of the celestial revolution. He gave his promise. Tomorrow, he said. And when the morrow came he continued his anti-militarist propaganda at Isiles Molinos. Like the titan Prometheus, Ister loved mankind. Arcade, suffering from all the desires to which the sons of Adam are subjected, found himself lacking in resources to satisfy them. Ister gave him a start in a printing house in the Rue de Vaugerard where he knew the foreman. Arcade, thanks to his celestial intelligence, soon knew how to set up type and became, in a short time, a good compositor. After standing all day in the whirring workroom, holding the composing stick in his left hand, and swiftly drawing the little leaden signs from the case in the order required by the copy fixed in the visorium, he would go and wash his hands at the pump and dine at the corner bar, a newspaper propped up before him on the marble table. Being now no longer invisible, he could not make his way into the Dias Barview library, and was thus debarred from allaying his ardent thirst for knowledge at that inexhaustible source. He went, of an evening, to read at the library of Assay Genevieve on the famous Hill of Learning, but there were only ordinary books to be had there, greasy things, covered with ridiculous annotations, and lacking many pages. The sight of women troubled and unsettled him. He would remember Madame de Albels and her charm, and, although he was handsome, he was not loved, because of his poverty and his workaday clothes. He saw much of Zita, 
and took a certain pleasure in going for walks with her on Sundays along the dusty roads which edged the grass-grown trenches of the fortifications. They wandered, the pair of them, by wayside inns, market gardens, and green retreats, propounding and discussing the vastest plans that ever stirred the world, and, occasionally, as they passed along by some traveling circus, the steam organ of the merry-go-round would furnish an accompaniment to their words as they breathed fire and fury against heaven. Zita used often to say, Ister means well, but he's a simple fellow. He believes in the goodness of men and things. He undertakes the destruction of the old world and imagines that anarchy of itself will create order and harmony. You, Arcade, you believe in science, you deem that men and angels are capable of understanding, whereas, in point of fact, they are only creatures of sentiment. You may be quite sure that nothing is to be obtained from them by appealing to their intelligence, one must rouse their interests and their passions. Arcade, Ister, Zeta, and three or four other angelic conspirators occasionally foregathered in Theophile Belay's little flat, where Brashat gave them tea. Though she did not know that they were rebellious angels, she hated them instinctively, and feared them, for she had had a Christian education, albeit she had sadly failed to keep it up. Prince Ister alone pleased her, she thought there was something kind-hearted and an air of natural distinction about him. He stove in the sofa, broke down the armchairs, and tore corners off sheets of music to make notes, which he thrust into pockets invariably crammed with pamphlets and bottles. The musician used to gaze sorrowfully at the manuscript of his operetta, Aline, Queen of Golconda, with its corners all torn off. The prince also had a habit of giving Theophile Bellace all sorts of things to take care of the mechanical contrivances, chemicals, bits of old iron, powders, and liquids which gave off noisome smells. Theophile Bellace put them cautiously away in the cupboard where he kept his wings, and the responsibility weighed heavily upon him. Arcade was much pained at the disdain of those of his fellows who had remained faithful. When they met him as they went on their sacred errands they regarded him as they passed by with looks of cruel hatred or of pity that was crueler still. He used to visit the rebel angels whom Prince Sister pointed out to him, and usually met with a good reception, but as soon as he began to speak of conquering heaven, they did not conceal the embarrassment and displeasure he caused them. Arcade perceived that they had no desire to be disturbed in their tastes, their affairs, and their habits. The falsity of their judgment, the narrowness of their minds, shocked him, and the rivalry, the jealousy they displayed towards one another deprived him of all hope of uniting them in a common cause. Perceiving how exile debases the character and warps the intellect, he felt his courage fail him. One evening, when he had confessed his weariness of spirit to Zeta, the beautiful archangel said, Let us go and see Netair. Netair has remedies of his own for sadness and fatigue. She led him into the woods of Montmorency and stopped at the threshold of a small white house, adjoining a kitchen garden, laid waste by winter, where far back in the shadows the light shone on forcing frames and cracked glass melon shades. Netair opened the door to his visitors, and, after quieting the growls of a big mastiff which protected the garden, led them into a low room warmed by an earthenware stove. Against the whitewashed wall, on a deal board, among the onions and seeds, lay a flute ready to be put to the lips. A round walnut table bore a stone tobacco jar, a pipe, a bottle of wine and some glasses. The gardener offered each of his guests a cane-seated chair, and himself sat down on a stool by the table. He was a sturdy old man, thick gray hair stood up on his head, he had a furrowed brow, a snub nose, a red face, and a forked beard. The big mastiff stretched himself at his master's feet, rested his short black muzzle on his paws, and closed his eyes. The gardener poured out some wine for his guests, and when they had drunk and talked a little, Zita said to Netair. Please play your flute to us, you will give pleasure to my friend whom I have brought to see you. The old man immediately consented. He put the boxwood pipe to his lips, so clumsy was it that it looked as if the gardener had fashioned it himself, and prelude with a few strange runs. Then he developed rich melodies in which the thrill sparkled like diamonds and pearls on a velvet ground. 
touched by cunning fingers, animated with creative breath, the rustic pipe sang like a silver flute. There were no overshrill notes and the tone was always even and pure. One seemed to be listening to the nightingale and the muses singing together, the soul of nature and the soul of man. And the old man ordered and developed his thoughts in a musical language full of grace and daring. He told of love, of fear, of vain quarrels, of all-conquering laughter, of the calm light of the intellect, of the arrows of the mind piercing with their golden shafts the monsters of ignorance and hate. He told also of joy and sorrow bending their twin heads over the earth and of desire which brings worlds into being. The whole night listened to the flute of Netair. Already the evening star was rising above the paling horizon. There they sat, Zita with hands clasped about her knees, Arcade, his head leaning on his hand, his lips apart. Motionless they listened. A lark, which had awakened hard by in a sandy field, lured by these novel sounds, rose swiftly in the air, hovered a few seconds, then dropped at one swoop into the musician's orchard. The neighboring sparrows, forsaking the crannies of the moldering walls, came and sat in a row on the window ledge whence notes came welling forth that gave them more delight than oats or grains of barley. A jay, coming for the first time out of his wood, folded his sapphire wings on a leafless cherry tree. Beside the drainhead, a large black rat, glistening with the greasy water of the sewers, sitting on his hind legs, raised his short arms and slender fingers in amazement. A field mouse, that dwelt in the orchard, was seated near him. Down from the tiles came the old tomcat, who retained the gray fur, the ring tail, the powerful loins, the courage, and the pride of his ancestors. He pushed against the half-open door with his nose and approaching the flute player with silent tread, sat gravely down, pricking his ears that had been torn in many a nocturnal combat, the grocer's white cat followed him, sniffing the vibrant air and then, arching her back and closing her blue eyes, listened in ravishment. Mice, swarming in crowds from under the boards, surrounded them, and fearing neither tooth nor claw, sat motionless, their pink hands folded voluptuously on their bosoms. Spiders that had strayed far from their webs, with waving legs, gathered in a charmed circle on the ceiling. A small gray lizard, that had glided onto the doorstep, stayed there, fascinated, and, in the loft, the bat might have been seen hanging by her nails, head down, now half-awakened from her winter sleep, swaying to the rhythm of the marvelous flute. 